Good afternoon. Making the world safer by preventing nuclear terrorism. That was President Obama's goal when he made nuclear security an international priority in Prague in 2009. We have taken a big step in that direction here in The Hague. I am proud to present our The Hague Nuclear Summit communique to you today. Building on the progress we made earlier in Washington and Seoul, this communique sets the bar even higher. We have taken major steps towards meeting all three main objectives of the NSS process. I'll say a few words about each of them. The first objective is to reduce the amount of dangerous nuclear material in the world. The less dangerous nuclear material there is, and the better the nuclear security, the smaller the chance the terrorists will be able to get hold of it. It's that simple. That's why I'm, ple I'm pleased that the 53 countries and four international organizations here have confirmed their commitment to continue reducing stocks of dangerous nuclear material, highly enriched uranium and plutonium. A number of countries have announced their intention to hand over the highly enriched uranium to the US, where it will be downgraded. As chair of this summit, I naturally welcome this announcement. We are also making progress on the second objective, improving the security of nuclear and other radioactive material. We have affirmed our ambition to improve the security of materials that can be used to make nuclear weapons, and the security of radiological sources that terrorists could use to make dirty bombs. The commitment of the NSS became more concrete in this matter. The scale of panic and fear a dirty bomb would cause doesn't bear thinking about, not to mention the possible disruption to society. So I'm especially pleased that we are widening the scope of the NSS process to include this area. Furthermore, the NSS countries have encouraged implementation of the IAEA nuclear security guidelines. A significant number of us have decided to take this commitment even further. As chair of this summit, I'm delighted to announce that two-thirds of the NSS countries on the initiative of the United States, Korea and the Netherlands have pledged to incorporate these important IAEA recommendations into their national legislation. This sends a valuable message and represents tangible progress. I can't stress enough how important this is. And fortunately, the group of countries supporting this initiative is growing. Our ultimate goal is, of course, for all NSS countries to follow this lead and set an example for other countries. I am also pleased with the growing awareness among NSS countries of the importance of nuclear forensics. Because if nuclear material is misused or smuggled, it's important to be able to determine the origin of the material and trace the smugglers. The Netherlands Forensic Institute is playing a prominent role, and I expect it will produce a lot of good work in this field in the coming years. The third main objective of the summit is to enhance international cooperation. A substantial part of the communique addresses this, and we are making good progress. The closing statement lays the basis for an efficient and sustainable international security architecture. For the first time, there will be a complete and coherent overview of the international nuclear security architecture, with the IAEA taking the lead. There is still a lot of work to be done in this area, too. I expect that we will be able to finish up the details at the summit in 2016 in the US. The final point I'd like to address is the importance of improving the working relationship between government and the nuclear industry. This is an issue that is very important to the Netherlands. We need industry with us if we are to develop effective security measures that don't cause needless harm to the economy. That's why I applaud the worldwide nuclear sector for meeting the last few days in Amsterdam to discuss this subject. Cooperation is now very much on track. I don't want to close this summit without expressing my admiration for the thousands of people who made it possible. The organizers, the security staff who made sure the summit proceeded safely and went off without a hitch. The people who managed the traffic. There are simply too many to mention. I know how hard everyone worked and I want to thank them all for their dedication and effort. And I want to thank the people of the Netherlands for their patience and understanding. We have seen the Netherlands at its best. I am proud of that. I conclude. Two days ago, I used a football metaphor when I said that the ball was on the penalty spot. As chair of this edition of the NSS, I am delighted that the NSS countries and organizations have scored a goal and that we have taken another step towards making the world safer. But we are not there yet. The NSS process will continue 
And in two years, we'll meet again to raise the bar even higher in all our interests. The summit in 2016 will be chaired by the man who initiated the analysis process, President Obama. So now, Barack, I'm pleased to give the floor to you. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister Rutte. Um, we could not be more grateful for your leadership uh, in this entire process, and so thank you so much. Uh, with your indulgence, uh, before I speak a little bit about this summit, uh, I'd like to say a few words about a tragedy that recently took place uh, back in the United States. Over the weekend, a massive landslide swept through a tiny town called uh, Oso in Washington State. And while I won't get ahead of the ongoing response and rescue operations, we know that part of this tightly knit community has been lost. Uh, first responders have acted bravely despite still dangerous conditions. Uh, the American Red Cross has opened multiple shelters, and the people of Washington State have been quick to help and comfort their fellow citizens. Uh, I just spoke to Governor Inslee, uh, who swiftly declared a state of the emergency. Uh, I signed that emergency declaration to make sure he's got all the resources that he needs. Uh, my administration is in contact with them on an ongoing basis. FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers have also been on site to offer their assistance and expertise. Uh, so uh, I would just ask uh, all Americans to uh, send their thoughts and prayers uh, to Washington State and uh, the community of Oso and uh, the families and, and friends of those who uh, continue to be missing. Uh, we hope for the best, but uh, we recognize this is a tough situation. Now, uh, as for our work here in The Hague, uh, I want to just repeat uh, the extraordinary work that Mark uh, has done in helping to organize this. Uh, King Willem Alexander and the people of the Netherlands, uh, your hospitality has been uh, remarkable. Your organization has been flawless. Uh, to all the people who were involved in uh, putting this together, including those who were putting up with the traffic that I caused, I want to say thank you. Uh, I'm told there's a Dutch word that captures uh, the spirit, uh, which doesn't translate exactly into English, but let me uh, say that my first visit to the Netherlands has been truly uh, uh, huzelik. <laughs> so, you know, I convened the first nuclear security summit in Washington four years ago because I believed that we need a serious and sustained global effort to deal with one of the greatest threats to international security, and that's the specter of nuclear terrorism. We made further progress at our second summit in Seoul, and under your Prime Minister's stewardship, uh, we've built on that progress here. In keeping with the spirit of these summits, this was not about vague commitments. It was about taking tangible and concrete steps to secure more of the world's nuclear material so it never falls in the hands of terrorists, and that's what we've done. In particular, I want to commend Belgium and Italy for completing the removal of their excess supplies of highly enriched uranium and plutonium so that those supplies can be eliminated. In a major commitment, uh, Japan announced that it will work with the United States to eliminate hundreds of kilograms of weapons usable nuclear material from one of their experimental reactors. That's enough for, a dozen, uh, for dozens of nuclear weapons. Uh, dozens of other nations have agreed to take specific steps towards improving nuclear security in their own countries and to support our global efforts. Some have pledged to convert their research reactors to low-enriched uranium, which cannot be used to make a bomb. We've set new goals for implementing our nuclear security measures, including sharing more information to show that we're all living up to our commitments. Uh, I've made it clear that the United States will continue to do our part as well. Our nuclear regulator, We'll develop new guidelines to strengthen cybersecurity at our nuclear power plants, and we've pledged to pursue the production of a key medical isotope used to treat illnesses like cancer without relying on weapons usable material. Uh, we're also going to work with our partners around the world to install more radiation detectin, uh, detection equipment at ports and transit sites in order to combat nuclear smuggling. And all of this builds on our previous efforts. Uh, Twelve countries and two dozen nuclear facilities around the world have now rid themselves entirely of highly enriched uranium and plutonium. Dozens of nations have boosted security at their nuclear storage sites or built their own counter-smuggling teams or created new centers to improve nuclear security and training. Uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, uh, is now stronger and 
More countries have ratified the treaties and international partnerships at the heart of our efforts. So we've seen a fundamental shift in our approach to nuclear security. Uh, but as Mark indicated, we still have a lot more work to do to fulfill the ambitious goals we set four years ago, to fully secure all nuclear and radiological material, civilian and military, so that it can no longer pose a risk to any of our citizens. Uh, I believe this is essential to the security of the entire world, and given the catastrophic uh, consequences of even a single attack, uh, we cannot be complacent. I'll close by reminding everyone that one of the achievements of our first summit in 2010 was Ukraine's decision to remove all its highly enriched uranium from its nuclear fuel sites. Uh, had that not happened, those dangerous nuclear materials would still be there now. And the difficult situation we're dealing with in Ukraine today would involve yet another level of concern. So it's a vivid reminder that the more of this material we can secure, the safer all of our countries will be. Uh, we've made progress. We've got more to do. Uh, we're going to continue our work, and I look forward to hosting the fourth Nuclear Security Summit in the United States in two years. So thank you again, Mark, and all your team, as well as the people of the Netherlands, for this outstanding summit. Thank you, Mr. President. We'll go straight to the questions now. And the first question will be Julie Peace, Associate Press. Thank you, Mr. President. You've been criticized during this dispute with Russia as not understanding President Putin's motivations. As recently as last month, you and others in your administration said you thought Putin was reflecting or pausing his incursion into Crimea. Did you misread Putin's intentions, and what do you think his motivations are now? And if I could just quickly ask on NSA, when you spoke about the NSA review in January, you said you weren't sold on the option of having phone companies hold metadata, and you thought it raised additional privacy concerns. What has changed for you on that matter since that time, and, and do you think Congress will pass the legislation you're seeking? And Mr. Prime Minister, there are leaders in Europe who have concerns about the sector sanctions the president has proposed on Russia's economy. Do you think any of those leaders have been have had their concerns alleviated during their talks with the president over the past few days? Thank you. All right. Let me see if I can remember all these. <laughs> um, with respect to President Putin's motivation, I think there's been a lot of speculation. I'm less interested in motivation and more interested in the facts and the principles that not only the United States but uh, the entire international community are, are looking to uphold. Uh, I don't think that any of us uh, have uh, been under any illusion that uh, you know, Russia has been very interested in controlling what happens to Ukraine. That's not new. That's been the case for years now. Uh, that's been the case dating back to the or Orange Revolution. Um, but what we have said consistently throughout this process is that it is up to the Ukrainian people to make their own decisions about uh, how they organize themselves uh, and who they interact with. Uh, and it's always been our belief that Ukraine is going to have a relationship to Russia. There is a strong historic bond between the two countries. Uh, but that that does not justify Russia encroaching on Ukraine's territorial integrity or sovereignty. Uh, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, and I said very early on that should Russia do so, there would be consequences. Uh, and working with our European partners and our international partners, we have put in place uh, sanctions that uh, have already had some impact on the Russian economy. Now, moving forward, you know, we have said, and I want to be very clear about this, we're not recognizing uh, what has happened in Crimea. The notion that uh, a referendum sloppily organized over the course of two weeks uh, would somehow uh, justify uh, the breaking off of Crimea and the annexation by Russia, um, you know, that somehow that would be a valid process, I think the overwhelming majority of the world rejects. Uh, but we are also concerned about further encroachment by Russia into Ukraine. So uh, what I announced 
And what the European Council announced was that we were consulting and putting in place the framework, the architecture for additional sanctions, additional costs, uh, should Russia take this next step. What we also said, and will continue to say, is that there is another path available to Russia. The Ukrainian government has said it is prepared to negotiate with Russia, that it is prepared to recognize its international obligations. Uh, and the international community has been supportive of a diplomatic process that would allow a de-escalation of tensions, a moving back of uh, Russian troops uh, from Ukraine's borders, uh, and rapidly organized elections that allow the Ukrainian people to choose their leadership. And my expectation is, is that if the Ukrainian people are allowed to make their own decisions, their decision will be that they want to have a relationship with Europe and they want to have a relationship with Russia, and that this is not a zero-sum game. Uh, and I think that uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk and the current government have shown remarkable restraint uh, and are prepared uh, to go down that diplomatic path. It is now up to Russia to act responsibly and show itself uh, to be uh, once again willing to abide by uh, international rules and international norms. Uh, and if it chooses to do so, I think that there can be a better outcome. Uh, if it fails to do so, there will be additional costs, and those will have some disruptive effect to the global economy, but uh, they'll have the greatest impact on Russia. Uh, so I think that will be a bad choice for President Putin to make, but ultimately uh, he's the president of Russia and, uh, and he's the one who's going to be making that decision. Uh, he just has to understand that there's a choice to be made here. Um, with respect, even though this was directed at Mark, I just want to uh, address this issue of sector, uh, sectoral sanctions. Uh, so far what we've done is we've put in place sanctions that impact individuals, uh, restricts uh, visas being issued to them, uh, freezes their assets. Uh, we have identified one bank in particular in Russia that uh, was well known to, to be uh, the bank of choice for many of the uh, uh, persons who support and facilitate uh, Russian officials from uh, carrying out some of these activities. Uh, but what we've held off on are more broad-based sanctions that would impact entire sectors of the Russian economy. Uh, it has not just been my suggestion, but it has also been the European Council's suggestion that should Russia go further, such sec sectoral uh, sanctions would be appropriate. Uh, and that would include areas potentially like energy or finance or arms sales. Uh, or trade uh, that exists uh, between Europe and the United States uh, and Russia. Uh, and what we're doing now is, at a very technical level, examining the impacts of each of these sanctions. Uh, some particular sanctions would hurt some countries more than others. Uh, but all of us recognize that we have to stand up for a core principle uh, that lies at the heart of uh, the international order and that facilitated the uh, European Union and the incredible prosperity and peace that uh, Europe has enjoyed now for decades. Uh, and so, uh, although it could cause some disruptions to each of our economies or certain industries, uh, what I've been encouraged by is the, uh, the firmness uh, and the willingness on the part of all countries uh, to, to look at ways in which they can participate uh, in, in this process. Uh, our preference throughout will be to resolve this diplomatically, but I think we're prepared, as we've already shown, uh, to take the next step if uh, the situation gets worse. Uh, finally, on Ukraine, I think it's very important that we spend uh, as much effort on bolstering the economy inside of Ukraine and making sure that the elections uh, proceed in an orderly fashion. And so my hope is that the IMF 
is able to complete a package for Ukraine rapidly to stabilize their finances and their economy. Uh, the OSCE, other international organizations are sending in observers and monitors, and we're providing technical assistance to make sure that the elections are free and fair. Uh, the sooner those elections take place, the sooner the economy is stabilized, uh, the better uh, positioned the Ukrainian people will be uh, in terms of uh, managing what is a, a very challenging situation. Uh, with respect to the NSA, and I'll be just brief on this, I said several months ago that I was assigning uh, our various agencies in the IC, uh, the uh, intelligence community, to bring me new options with respect to the uh, telephone database program. Uh, they have presented me now with an option that I think is workable, and it addresses the two core concerns that people had. Number one, the idea of government storing uh, bulk data generally. Uh, this ensures that the government is not in possession of that bulk data. I want to emphasize once again that some of the uh, dangers that uh, people hypothesized when it came to bulk data, uh, there were clear safeguards against. But I recognize that people were concerned about what might happen in the future with that bulk data. This uh, proposal that's been presented to me would eliminate that concern. Uh, the second thing uh, the people were concerned about is making sure that uh, not only is a judge overseeing the overall program, but also that a judge is looking at each individual inquiry that's made into a database. Uh, and this uh, uh, new plan that's been presented to me does that. Uh, so uh, overall, I'm confident that it allows us to do what is necessary in order to deal with uh, uh, the dangers of a terrorist attack but does so in a way that addresses some of the concerns uh, that people had raised. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with Congress to make sure that it, uh, uh, we go ahead and, and pass the enabling legislation quickly uh, so that we can uh, get on with the business of uh, effective law enforcement. On Ukraine, let me make it absolutely clear that the European Union and the U.S., and yesterday we saw alignment within the G7. We are working very closely together. Um, and um, I can fully support all the answers which you just gave, uh, just given on the question you asked. Maybe I can add one thing, which is the highly uh, there, uh, the fact that the Russian economy is very much gas and oil dependent. And um, uh, that means that economic sanctions, if they would be necessary, and we are not there yet. Uh, if economic sanctions would be necessary because this conflict would uh, escalate to a next stage, that if this were to happen, uh, these sanctions would hit Russia very badly. And obviously, you can never guarantee that the people in Europe, in Canada, in the US would not be hurt. But obviously, we will make sure that we will design these sanctions in such a way that they will have maximum impact on the Russian economy and not on the European, the Canadian, the Japanese or the American economy. That is our aim. But we work very closely together uh, and we seek total alignment on this issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, Ilko Bos van Rosenthal, Niels Uur. Question for President Obama on Ukraine. Um, reportedly there are about 30,000 Russian troops on the border with Ukraine. What guarantees can you give to the people of eastern Ukraine, to the people uh, in the Baltic states, uh, Moldova, other countries, that they will not be next when it comes to the Russian uh, politics of annexation. And with regard to that also, um, is this a done deal? Is there any doubt in your mind that Putin will return Crimea to where it belongs, according to the West? Or is this diplomatic show of force basically just to prevent another land grab somewhere else. On the second question first, uh, on the issue of Crimea, uh, it's not a done deal in the sense that the international community by and large is not recognizing the annexation of Crimea. Um, you know, obviously, the facts are, on the ground are that the Russian military controls Crimea. Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, individuals inside of Crimea that are supportive of that process. 
there's no expectation that they will be dislodged by force. Uh, and so uh, what we can bring to bear are uh, the legal arguments, the diplomatic arguments, the political pressure, the economic sanctions that are already in place uh, to try to make sure that there's a cost to that process. Uh, but uh, you know, I think it would be uh, uh, dishonest uh, to suggest that there's a, a simple solution to uh, resolving uh, what has already taken place in Crimea. Uh, although, you know, history has a funny way of uh, moving in twists and turns and not just in a straight line. So, you know, how the situation in Crimea evolves in part depends on making sure that the international community stays unified uh, in uh, indicating that this was an illegal action uh, on the part of Russia. Uh, with respect to the uh, Russian troops that are uh, along the border of Ukraine at the moment, uh, right now they are on Russian soil. Uh, and uh, if they stay on Russian soil, uh, we uh, we oppose what appears to be an effort in intimidation, uh, but uh, Russia has a right legally to uh, have its troops uh, uh, on its own soil. Uh, I don't think it's a done deal, and I think that Russia is still making a series of calculations. Uh, and again, those calculations will be impacted in part by how unified the United States and Europe are uh, and the international community is. Uh, in saying to Russia that this is not uh, how in the 21st century we, we resolve disputes. Uh, I think it's particularly important for all of us to uh, dismiss this notion that somehow Russian speakers or Russian nationals inside of Ukraine are threatened and that somehow that would justify Russian action. There has been no evidence that uh, Russian speakers have been uh, in any way threatened. Uh, if anything, what we've seen are provocateurs who have uh, created uh, you know, scuffles uh, inside of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, you know, when I hear analogies, for example, to Kosovo, where you had thousands of people who were being slaughtered uh, by their government, uh, you know, it's a comparison that uh, makes absolutely no sense, and I think it's important for everybody to be clear that, and, and strip away some of the possible excuses uh, for uh, potential Russian action. Uh, with respect to the broader issue of uh, states that are bordering uh, Russia and uh, you know, what assurances do they have uh, about uh, future uh, land grabs, as you put it, um, obviously you know, some of those countries are NATO countries, and uh, as NATO allies, we uh, believe that uh, the cornerstone of our security is uh, making sure that all of us, including the United States, are abiding by Article 5 uh, and the notion of collective defense. Uh, and you know, what we are now doing is organizing uh, even more intensively to make sure that uh, we have contingency plans and that every one of our NATO allies has assurances that we will act in their defense uh, against any threats. That's what NATO is all about, uh, and that's been the cornerstone of, of peace uh, in the transatlantic region now for uh, several generations. Uh, so we will uphold that, uh, and there will be a series of NATO consultations. A NATO ministerial is going to be coming up uh, in which we further develop and deepen uh, those plans. But I have not seen uh, any NATO members who have not expressed uh, a firm determination uh, with respect to NATO members. Now, outs uh, those who are – those countries, border, uh, border countries that are outside of NATO, uh, you know, what we can do is what we're doing with Ukraine, which is trying to make sure that there's sufficient international pressure uh, and a spotlight shine on, uh, on the situation in some of these countries, and that we're also doing everything we can to bolster their economies, make sure that – uh, through various diplomatic and uh, economic initiatives that they feel supported uh, and that they know that we stand by them. Uh, but when it comes to uh, a potential military response, you know, that is defined by NATO membership. Uh, that's what NATO is about. 
Jan Carl from ABC News. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, in China, in Syria, in Egypt, and now in Russia, we've seen you make strong statements, issue warnings that have been ignored. Are, are you concerned that America's influence in the world, your influence in the world, is on the decline? And in the light of recent developments, do you think Mitt Romney had a point when he said that uh, Russia is America's biggest geopolitical foe, if not Russia, who? And uh, Mr. Prime Minister, do you think these uh, sanctions uh, will change Vladimir Putin's calculation, will cause him to back down? And do you see there's a, you know, where do you see a Russian red line uh, where if they go any further, if they go into eastern Ukraine, into Moldova, where options beyond sanctions have to be considered? Thank you. Well, Jonathan, um, I think if the premise of the question is that uh, whenever the United States objects to an action uh, and uh, other countries don't immediately do exactly what we want, uh, uh, that that's been the norm, uh, that would pretty much erase most of 20th century history. Uh, I think that uh, there's a distinction between us being very clear about what we think is an appropriate action, what we stand for, what principles we believe in, uh, versus uh, what is, I guess, implied in the question, uh, that we should uh, engage in some sort of military action to prevent something. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, the world's always been messy. And what the United States has consistently been able to do, and we continue to be able to do, is to mobilize the international community around a set of principles and norms, and where our own uh, self-defense may not be involved, uh, we may not act militarily. That does not mean that we don't steadily push against those forces that would violate those principles and ideals that we care about. Uh, so uh, yes, you're right. Uh, Syria, the Syrian civil war is not solved. Uh, and yet, Syria has never been more isolated. Uh, with respect to uh, the situation in Ukraine, uh, we have not gone to war with Russia. Uh, I think there's a significant precedent to that in the past. Uh, that does not mean that uh, Russia is not isolated. In fact, Russia is far more isolated in this instance than it uh, was five years ago with respect to Georgia, and more isolated than it was uh, certainly during most of uh, the 20th century uh, when it was part of the Soviet Union. Uh, th the point is that uh, there are always going to be bad things that happen around the world. Uh, and the United States, as uh, the most powerful nation in the, uh, in the world, understandably uh, is looked to for solutions to those problems. And what we have to make sure we're doing are that we are putting all elements of our power behind finding solutions, working with our international partners, standing up for those principles and ideals in a clear way. Uh, there are going to be moments where uh, military action is appropriate. There are going to be some times where uh, that's not in the interests, national security interests of the United States or some of our partners. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to make the effort or speak clearly about what we think is right and wrong. And that's what we've done. Uh, with respect to Mr. Romney's uh, assertion that uh, Russia is num our number one geopolitical foe, the truth of the matter is that um, you know, America's got a whole lot of challenges. Uh, Russia is a regional power that is threatening some of its immediate neighbors, not out of strength, but out of weakness. Uh, Ukraine has been a country in which Russia had enormous influence for decades, since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, and you know, we have considerable influence on our neighbors. We generally don't need to invade them in order to uh, have a strong cooperative relationship with them. Uh, the fact that Russia felt compelled to go in militarily and lay bare uh, these violations of international law uh, indicates less influence, not more. And so my response then uh, continues to be uh, what I believe today, which is Russia's actions are a problem. 
They don't pose the number one national security threat to the United States. Uh, I continue to be much more concerned when it comes to our security with the prospect of uh, a nuclear weapon going off in Manhattan, which is part of the reason why uh, the United States, showing its continued international leadership, uh, has organized uh, a forum over the last several years that's been able to help eliminate uh, that threat in a consistent way. There is no geopolitical conflict which can be solved without the United States. And uh, therefore, I applaud the fact that President Obama's administration is active in every arena. Ukraine, Iran, Syria, the Middle East peace process, and so many other parts of the world. Take the initiatives Secretary of State Kerry is taking now in the Middle East peace process. I was in December in the region. I spoke with the senior leaders, both in Israel and the Palestinian ter territories. And they are extremely grateful for the fact that America is providing that leadership. This is a difficult issue. It can't be solved overnight. There is no magic, magic wand which can handle this. But progress is being made. Take Iran. I spoke with President Rouhani in Davos at the World Economic Forum in January. We have now an interim accord. The fact that I was able, first Dutch leader in over 30, 40 years who spoke with an Iranian, Iranian leader, President Rouhani, was possible because of the interim accord, and it seems that it is holding. Uh, America provided leadership there. Uh, so I really applaud uh, President Obama's role in all these major issues. And it is necessary because the United States is the leader of the free world and needs to provide that leadership, and he is doing that. Then on your question about uh, President Putin, I cannot... It's very difficult to, to exactly judge what is happening in the senior leadership in Moscow, in Russia, at this moment. Uh, but as I said earlier, a highly uh, undiversified economy, like the Russian economy, which is so much oil and gas dependent, which has not invested in infrastructure, invested in other areas of its economy. It will be worried if there is a risk that in the financial sector, or in weapons, or in trade, or indeed in energy, uh, there could be potential sanctions. That will hurt them. And that's what I said earlier. We have to design them in such a way that they will particularly hit Russia and not Europe, the US, Canada, or Japan. Uh, that is what we are working on, and we hope we won't need them. And then on the red lines, I cannot envisage this conflict ending up in a military conflict. I don't think that is likely. I don't think anybody wants it. And at the same time, I totally agree with uh, President Obama's answer on Article 5, when this conflict will be taken to the borders of one of the NATO countries. But luckily, that is at this moment not the case. Final questions for Hendrikus Wilcher, AMP. President, you met a lot of leaders here. Many were angry about the NSA story. Uh, have you fixed the relationships with these leaders? And the second question is, many are shocked by the extent of which the NSA collects private data. Today we read in the New York Times that you plan to end the systematic collection of data of Americans. Uh, but can you address the concerns of the Dutch and the rest of the world about their privacy? Well, uh, first of all, we have had a consistent, uh, unbreakable bond between uh, the leaders of Europe uh, over the last uh, several decades. Uh, and it's across many dimensions, economic, military, uh, counterterrorism, cultural. Uh, and so any one issue can be an irritant in the relationship between the countries, but uh, it doesn't define uh, those relationships, and that continues to be the case, and that has been the case uh, throughout the last couple of years. Uh, as I said in a speech that I gave earlier this year, uh, the United States is very proud of its record of working with countries around the world to prevent terrorism or nuclear proliferation or human trafficking or a whole host of issues that all of us, I think, would be concerned about. Intelligence plays a critical role in that process. Uh, what we've seen is that as technology has evolved, uh, the guidelines and structures uh, that constrain how our intelligence agencies operated have uh, not kept pace with these advances in technology. Uh, and although, you know, having 
examined over the last, uh, over the last year, year and a half, uh, what's been done. Uh, I'm confident that everybody in our intelligence agencies operates in the best of intentions and is not snooping into the privacy of ordinary uh, Dutch, German, French, or American citizens. Uh, what is true is, is that there is a danger because of these new technologies that at some point it could be abused. And that's why I initiated a broad-based review of what we could do. There are a couple of things that we did that are unprecedented. Um, in my speech, I announced that for the first time uh, under my direction, that we are going to treat the privacy concerns of non-U.S. persons uh, as seriously as we are the constraints that already exist by law on U.S. persons. Uh, we're doing that not because we're bound by international law, but because ultimately it's the right thing to do. Uh, with respect to uh, some of the aspects of data collection, what I've been very clear about is, is that there has to be a narrow purpose to it, not a broad-based purpose, but it's rather based on a specific concern around terrorism or counterproliferation or uh, human trafficking or something that uh, I think all of us would say has to be uh, pursued. Uh, and so what I've tried to do then is to make sure that my intelligence teams are uh, consulting very closely at each stage with their counterparts uh, in other nations so that there's greater transparency in terms of what exactly we're doing, what we're not doing. Some of the uh, reporting uh, here in Europe, as well as in the United States, frankly, has been uh, pretty sensationalized. Um, I think the fears about our privacy in this age of the Internet and uh, big data are justified. Uh, I think the actual facts uh, people would have an assurance if, uh, that if you are just the ordinary citizen uh, in any of these countries that uh, your privacy, in fact, is not being invaded on. But I recognize that uh, because of these revelations, uh, that there's a process that's taking place where we have to win back the trust, not just of governments, but more importantly of ordinary citizens. Uh, and that's not going to happen overnight, uh, because I think that there's a tendency uh, to be skeptical of government and to be skeptical in particular of uh, U.S. intelligence services. Uh, and so it's going to be necessary for us. The step we took uh, that was announced today, I think, is an example of us slowly, systematically, putting in more checks, balances, legal processes. Um, the good news is that I'm very confident that it can be achieved. Uh, and I'm also confident that the core values that America has always believed in, in terms of privacy, rule of law, uh, individual rights, uh, that that has guided uh, you know, the United States for, for many years and will continue to guide us into the future. Okay. Okay, the Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you again.